Hello, and welcome everyone. In this podcast, we're going to talk about gene regulation in bacteria. So we'll write bacterial gene regulation. Genes can be regulated at several different levels. More so in eukaryotes, but even in bacteria, there's a very complex systems to regulate genes. It can be re regulated at the transcription level. So when those genes are turned on or turned off is an important um, way bacteria regulate their genes. In fact, it's probably the most important way that bacteria regulate their genes. Once this messenger RNA is made, before it gets translated, so translational, level. So before that messenger RNA can be made into a protein, there are various mechanisms that can be used to regulate whether or not it will make a protein. And then finally, after that protein is made, we can have post translational control. So the post translational level. So once that protein is made, often that protein is not functional until it's been modified in some way. And then we end up with a functional protein. For the purpose of this course, we're going to focus almost exclusively at the level of transcription. Even when we move to eukaryotes, we're going to really think more about regulation at the transcriptional level. Your book describes four different ways in a very general sense of how genes can be regulated. And I think it's best to first define genes. A gene can either be an inducible gene or a repressible gene. So an inducible gene is a gene that is normally off, but can be turned on, or it can be induced. A repressible gene is a gene that is usually on, but it can be turned off. That is, it can be repressed. The proteins that regulate can be classified as one of two types. And again, we're speaking very broadly and generally. They can either be an activator protein or a repressor protein. Activator proteins, as the name implies here, they turn genes on. Repressor proteins will turn genes off. And lastly, we want to talk about two other important parts of these systems. And these are usually small molecules that bind to the repressor or the activator. These molecules can be an inducer. These are either bind to one of these proteins, an activator protein or a repressor protein, and under certain circumstances, they will cause these proteins to turn the gene on or keep the gene on. The other one is a co-repressor or an inhibitor. And these are going to be important in keeping the gene off. They too will bind to either activator proteins or repressor proteins to keep a particular gene on. Okay, let me briefly review what we just said here because these six factors are, in, are very important in understanding how genes are regulated in bacteria. And if you understand these, what you'll see is we're going to mix and match these in different ways to explain different systems. So these first two, inducible and repressible, these refer to the gene. So let me put a G here. Three and four here they refer to the protein. 
that is either going to be play a direct role in turning a gene on or off. These down here, these inducer and co-repressors or inhibitors, are, are signaling molecules that bind to these proteins. Okay, now let's walk through some examples. In this first example, we're going to talk about an inducible gene, a repressor protein, and an inducer molecule. So let's see how these three components lead to gene transcription. Okay, so let's draw our gene here. Let's draw our promoter. I'm just going to put a P there, but that's for promoter. And then we're going to have our repressor bind near the promoter. And down here, this is our open reading frame, the part that's important to make the protein. In this case here, the gene is off. So let's write off in front of this here. And it's off because as the RNA polymerase comes along here, and sigma factor and all those things found in bacterial transcription, it may bind to this promoter, but this repressor blocks it. So the RNA polymerase cannot move past this. It serves as a roadblock. So if you want to turn this on, just remember we said this was a system involving a repressor, an inducible gene, meaning we can turn this gene on. It's normally off, but we can turn it on. And we're also going to have an inducer available. So to turn this gene on, what has to happen is that this repressor here, I should have probably labeled this, has to come off. It has to be removed. And it does this by having an inducer come along. And this inducer will bind to this repressor. And when it binds to this repressor, an allosteric change occurs. I'm going to come back to that word in just a moment. And when this occurs, if the repressor now falls off of the promoter. And now the RNA polymerase can bind here and begin to transcribe the gene. So the repressor needs to be removed. So again, it's an inducible gene. It's normally off, but now we can turn it on by removing this repressor from the promoter region by having it bind to an inducer. It's important for us to define this term here real quick. And it's called allosteric change. This is an incredibly important term when we think about how proteins behave in a cell. For our purpose, we think of an allosteric change as the way a protein will change its structure that gives it a different function or allows it to behave differently. So in this case, the repressor was bound to the promoter region. To get it off of this promoter region, it had to undergo an allosteric change so it could no longer bind to the DNA. So in this case, the allosteric change was caused by having this inducer molecule bind to the repressor. Once it bound, it caused this allosteric change and it fell off. You're going to hear the word allosteric change a lot as we talk about uh, gene regulation. Okay, so this is our first example. Let's look at a second example now. In this example, we're still going to talk about an inducible system, an inducible gene. But now we're going to talk about using an activator protein. And this activator protein is going to be activated by an inducer molecule. Okay, so let's draw this out. So let's draw our messenger RNA. Let's put our promoter in here again. And let's write up here what we're talking about again. So again, it's an inducible system. So it's going to normally be off, but it needs to be turned on. We're going to have an activator protein. That's going to play a role in inducing this system. And then we're going to have an inducer. 
and of course we have our open reading frame. Now in this system here, this gene, for whatever reason, is not able to have the RNA polymerase bind to the promoter. It's being prevented from doing so. So this gene is off. How will we go about turning the gene on? In this case, we're going to involve a, another protein, not a repressor this time, but an activator. So this activator is hanging out here up, uh, under this off state. But in order to turn the gene on, we have to get this activator to bind to the DNA. And what happens is the activator plus our inducer must come together. And when they bind, this inducer now changes the shape of the protein, the activator, causes that allosteric change. And now this allosteric change will bind like so. And now what this newly changed activator protein does is it binds to the DNA. And when it's bound to the DNA, it activates transcription. And it may activate transcription. It can do it in a couple different ways, a few different ways. But for this example, let's just say that this activator protein, once bound to the promoter or near the promoter, it allows for the attachment of RNA polymerase to this site. So it recruits RNA polymerase. Once RNA polymerase is bound to the DNA, then RNA polymerase, I'll just draw it like so, can begin to transcribe the gene. And now the gene is on. So again, this is an inducible system going from an off state to an on state. It does so by having an activator protein bind an inducer. Once it binds this inducer, it's able to bind to the DNA and recruit the RNA polymerase to turn the gene on. Okay, so this is our second example. We have two more examples to talk about. This time we want to talk about a repressible gene. So this is the first time we'll talk about repressible genes. A repressor protein and a co-repressor molecule. Okay, let's go ahead and draw this out. Okay, so again, it's, this is a repressible gene, meaning the gene's usually on, but it can be turned off. And we're going to talk about how we do this with a repressor protein and how we're going to utilize a co-repressor molecule. Or sometimes we'll call these inhibitors. Let's draw our gene here with our open reading frame down here and our promoter. So this is a repressible system. So in this case, unlike the last two examples, this gene is usually on. So under the normal circumstances, our RNA polymerase is bound here and it's transcribing the gene. Now we say this is a repressible system. So how are we going to turn this gene off that is now normally on? We're going to use a repressor protein. And this repressor protein may have always been around, but it's not able to bind to the promoter to prevent RNA polymerase from coming along. So what happens is, at some point, this repressor protein will bind this inhibitor or co-repressor. When it binds this inhibitor, there is an allosteric change that occurs, and now it is able to bind to this promoter. And now that the repressor is bound, because now it has this in, in, inhibitor attached to it, the repressor is bound here, and it prevents our friend RNA polymerase from having access to that promoter. So again, what happens in this system is you have RNA polymerase on the promoter making RNA in, a, in its normal state of being on. Within this system, you're going to have repressors around, but the repressor in this particular setup is unable to bind to the DNA. If you need to signal this gene to be turned off, what happens is an inhibitor will be present and it will bind to the repressor. Once it's bound to the repressor, an allosteric change occurs which now allows the repressor to bind to the, prom to the promoter, preventing the RNA polymerase from binding. So effectively turning this gene off now. Okay, we have one more system we want to talk about. 
And so let's go back to our, our previous board. In this system, we're going to talk about, again, our second example of a repressible gene. And this time we're going to talk about an activator protein and one of these inhibitor or co-repressor molecules. What you'll notice is that these inhibitors or co-repressors are always associated with a repressible gene and that these inducers are always associated with an inducible gene. Okay, so this system is going to involve a repressible system again, repressible gene. This time we're going to talk about an activator protein and a co-repressor. Let's go ahead and draw our gene, our open reading frame here. Let's put our promoter here. Now just like our last example, this gene is normally active. It is on. And it is in the on state because an activator protein is bound here. And as this activator protein is bound here, RNA polymerase is attracted to this activator. And when it binds to it, it is able to access the promoter and bind to the promoter. promoter and then activate transcription. So it is usually turned on and it's turned on because of this activator protein. But this is a repressible system, meaning we can repress it, we can turn it off. So how are we going to do that? So let's draw the gene one more time here with our promoter. Well not surprisingly, I'm sure you might have figured this out, is that our co-repressor will now enter into the system and when it binds this repressor it changes its conformation in using our famous allosteric change. And when it does that, this new change in shape prevents it from binding to the DNA. And when it can't bind to the DNA near the promoter, RNA polymerase can no longer access the promoter. Because remember, this activator protein was recruiting RNA polymerase to the promoter. And now that we've removed the activator because of this allosteric change, because the co-repressor bound to it, it prevents RNA polymerase from binding to this promoter. So we've talked about four different systems where either a gene is usually on and then it gets turned off, or a gene is usually off and it gets turned on. And we talked about these activator proteins and these repressor proteins. It is all really kind of complicated, complicated, I think. And I think the best thing to do is to draw this out many times. Draw a piece of DNA, put that, that ORF and turn it on or off, apply the appropriate repressor or, or activating protein and ask how you're gonna get that gene, that, that protein to bind to the DNA or to fall off the DNA. To help better explain this, this kind of, these four different kinds of uh, systems, in the next podcast, we're gonna talk about the lac operon in excruciating detail. But that is all I have for this particular podcast. So let me end with a quick summary. We began by talking briefly about how genes and bacteria can be regulated at the level of transcription, translation, or post-translation modifications. And we also said that even though there are these multiple levels, that we're going to focus on the levels at the uh, level of transcription. Then we talked about the four different ways genes can be regulated at the level of transcription. All right, ways to regulate. And we just talked about it, but we talked about activator proteins. We talked about repressor proteins. We talked about genes that could either be inducible or genes that could be repressible. Inducible genes are usually turned off, but we can turn them on. Repressible genes are usually turned on, but we can turn them off. And that's all we have for this podcast. Again, I, I do believe that this is tough to understand, and I, I think the best way to do it is just to draw this out, quizzing yourself with uh, the different proteins as they bind DNA or fall off DNA, how that's going to affect transcription. If you have any questions, please let me know. I'll be happy to help answer anything you have. If not, I'll see you in class. Bye.